My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. I always start my prayer making an act of faith in you, my Lord, in your presence. And maybe because I know the end of the story, in the sense that I read your life, and your resurrection, and your ascension into heaven, I'm filled with joy, with security. And it is good to feel that way, to know that you exist, that you love me, that I can talk to you at any time. And especially during these days of Easter, to feel the joy of your resurrection, to know that you are alive, that you breathe, that you are awaiting from me with a big smile in heaven, fills me with joy. But sometimes, my Lord, I think I take it for granted, and maybe I, I have to go back to the history of salvation. And then put myself in the shoes of the protagonists will help me a lot to grow. The adventure that they went through, all the saints, can teach me many things. Today I want to focus on one of my favorite ones. I don't know if you have your favorite saints. I do. And uh, all of them are awesome, really. But some of them are things stick out more, or or at least we feel more attracted to follow them because maybe we see something that uh, it is more human or is more attractive to us, whatever it is. Anyway, all of them are great. But today I want to read a little bit about the story of Mary Magdalene. Let's see how she reacted in front of difficulties. I remember, just to give a little bit of framework, that uh, when she went to the tomb, after the crucifixion, after three days, put yourself in her shoes and uh, think about what you have seen or what she had seen. Jesus Christ, for three years, preaching, performing miracles, talking to people one-on-one, visiting homes, going for dinner, interacting with kids, with men, women, soldiers, politicians, all sorts of people. And that dream that was amazing suddenly was shut down by the imprisonment, the torture, the crucifixion of him, of Jesus Christ. And then Mary Magdalene, two, three days, trying to cope with that reality of Jesus being dead. And then, you know, put yourself in those shoes and uh, think about it for a second. Try to understand how difficult it was for her to believe, as it is for us sometimes, my Lord, sometimes it's difficult to believe. And then in the chapter number 20 of St. John's Gospel, it says that Mary stayed out the, outside the tomb weeping in the morning of the resurrection. We know that it's the morning of the resurrection, but she didn't know that. It's not in the calendar. Mary Magdalene didn't wake up that day saying, oh, today's the morning of the resurrection. And she woke up with a traumatic experience of Jesus Christ, being dead and tortured. And the soldiers were around the tomb, guarding the tomb, and the rock was there, and it was dark. And many Jewish people, authorities, were against him, persecuting him. And then a woman, like her, just couldn't believe that. She couldn't accept that. And then moved by a tender love, by a like a very genuine love, she said to herself, I, I need to see him once, before he's completely buried forever. I need to say goodbye one more time. What a faith for me. What a great example for me. And then she went there, you know, overcoming any fear, overcoming any human calculation, no questions needed, like who would move the rock? What would I say to the soldiers? What if? No. Mary, with her ardent love for you, my Lord, needed to see you one more time, even if you were dead. And then she got there, and the tomb was empty, and the soldiers were in there. And then she started crying, thinking that that was the last injury or the last uh, way to just uh, to destroy any legacy that they have taken Jesus, even his body. And then she was outside the tomb, crying, weeping. And as she wept, she bent over into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there. And maybe because of that presence, she received a little bit of peace. 
and they said to her, woman, why are you crying? And she said to them, maybe yelling, I don't know. They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they had led him. Where is Jesus? I need him. I need you, my Lord. I don't want to live without you. I cannot. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus there, but did not know it was Jesus because maybe she was crying, she was confused, and then she saw a human figure there, a human silhouette, but she was so confused. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Why are you crying? And then a second question by Jesus to me is almost, you, my Lord, and I'm sorry about that, you almost pulling her leg. Whom are you looking for? And you know the answer for that question, but still you almost, I, I imagine Jesus with a big smile, asking Mary, why are you crying? And he's, he's asking you the same thing. Whom are you looking for? Why are you crying if you're looking for me? And then she thought he was the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you had laid him, and I will take him. What a strong love. What a big heart. And I'm not talking just emotionally. I'm saying what a deep faith and, and desires of were burning in the, in the heart of Mary, Magdalene. And then Jesus said, said to her, Mary, just that word, Mary, her name, calling her Mary. No more words needed. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher, master. She recognized the voice of Jesus. Maybe Jesus had an accent, right, from Galilee. And then Mary just being confused, crying. But suddenly the way Jesus pronounced her name was enough to recognize this is Jesus. That voice, that um, music, or that kind of a tone, or an accent maybe, it is so genuine from God. I know this. I know that he's calling me again. And he, and then Mary confused, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then Jesus said to her, go to my brothers and tell them, I'm going to my father and your father, to my God and your God. I don't think there are words to express the moment that we're living right now. Because it's now. It's the now resurrection that we are living today. Nothing has changed since that day in the history of Christianity. We are still in that morning. Right now, 20 centuries ago, we have the same Jesus, the same message. And I would love to have a video of that moment, right? All of us would love to, to have recorded in video, in images, or in pictures, that encounter. One of my big desires when I get to heaven with the grace of God is to sit down. I don't know your desire of heaven. I mean, for sure, each one of us has prepared a different heaven according to its personal heart. And after being in this world, we will get there and, uh, and we will contemplate God. We will see him face to face and, uh, and our hearts will explode in joy because we will be understood, healed, happy forever. And I, I don't know, but I, I, one thing that I told our Lord many times in, in my prayer, in my dialogue with you, my Lord, is that I want to sit down with you, two big sofas and, uh, and a big screen, and then to watch the whole history of salvation from the beginning to the end, in high definition. I want to see everything, and especially your life. I'm sure that, the, that in the heaven we can do whatever we want. So I, I want to do that, to see that moment of incarnation, the moment of your birth, your childhood, and to spend with you eternally, you know, sitting down there to see those 30 years of hidden life and your miracles and your words and you healing the lepers and multiplying the fish and the loves and walking on the sea and your crucifixion and your smile and your voice. And also that moment that changed everything forever. The moment of the resurrection, when you met Mary, your mother, and also Mary Magdalene. And at that moment of Mary Magdalene crying and, and holding on to you and, and you saying, go to my brothers, which is me. I have the legacy of Mary Magdalene in my hands, in my heart. She went to her brothers in the faith, to Peter, John, Andrew, all of them, and um, tell them, I'm going to my father and to your father, 
to my God and your God. I'm preparing for you a place. I'm, I'm, I'm alive. And uh, I don't know, my Lord, I want to enter into this joy of the resurrection with the idea of being closer to you, not only like um, in the sense of just by inertia or no, reviving, reliving now, right now, what Mary Magdalene experienced that morning. And maybe my Lord today, looking at you, being alive, loving me, opening for me the path toward heaven and accompanying me all the way through, I want to understand a little bit better the meaning of the resurrection. Because the resurrection has something special. It's not just a gratuitous grace that comes from nowhere. It is not just a random grace. It is a grace after pain and through pain. And that makes it more joyful. The journey of every saint is a special. And it's a special, of course, because of the end of the journey, but for because of the story of each one of us. That's what makes it interesting the ups and downs, the moments of darkness, the joys as well, that makes you real. And maybe in this morning of the resurrection, I can appreciate it better because I see the wounds in the heart of Mary Magdalene. I see her doubts. I see her fears. And I see myself. And then the the joy of the resurrection or, or the promise of heaven is not just a random thing that comes from nowhere, but it comes from the cross. And it makes it more real. The shadows in the paintings or in the drawings are, are good for, for, for the whole picture, to understand better depth, to understand better the, the light. And maybe today I want to meditate on that. Jesus, the whole story is not just the end. It's the process. Some years ago, when I was in Rome, one of my friends lost his wallet, or maybe it was stolen. The thing is that two hours later, the bank called him, or one of the banks, well, he, has, he had his, uh, his credit card, his bank account, saying, hey, someone is using your credit card. Is this, is this you? Or, and then he realized by then that uh, it was not him. So he immediately canceled the, the whole thing, the card, and, uh, and he lost maybe around 400 euros. I mean, it was bad, but not too bad after all, right? It could have been worse. Funny thing for me, not for him, but for me, is that he has the police or the bank, and then they track the the way that the money was spent, and then they realize that all the money was spent in baby clothes and baby food. And the explanation that the police gave him is that probably the wallet was found or stolen, we don't know, by a mom, maybe one of those moms that are poor. Maybe in Rome you have some gypsy communities. I don't know. I don't have anything against them, obviously. But maybe some mom from one of those communities found it and then she was in need and she went wild, right? Buying things for her baby, which is, I mean, at least the intentions are good. And uh, and my friend actually had, okay, at least, you know, it's for a baby. But if we had the chance to talk to that mom, we would tell her with peace, hey, listen, that's great. Your baby is gorgeous. And uh, I'm so happy that you had, you know, the courage to have a baby and in your situation. And But you were, that, that, that card is not just a magic card that appears on the trees or, oh, yeah, I'm lucky. It's not the lottery. That card is linked to a bank account of someone that is trying to provide for his family as well. And, uh, and that's not the way to do things, right? Whatever. In our interior life, in my interior life, Jesus... I need to understand this well, that there is a sort of a bank account, a budget for, for redemption, for saving the world. There's a price. There's a price for each soul. And that price is your crucifixion, your life, your whole life, Jesus, is, is the price, is the budget of redemption comes from there. And it's huge. It's eternal. We can use it as many times as we want to. It's, it's like a credit card you can keeps sweeping and and, and it gives you whatever you need, spiritually speaking. And it's fine that way. But it is good also to know the connection towards your heart. It's not just a random grace. Like God is not Mary Poppins, like (laughs) giving random graces through a wand that uh, provides anonymously or impersonally for some powers or whatever. Everything that we do, every conversion comes from your heart, opened in the crucifixion. And it's a joyful reality. It's not that we are sad. But it's good to know the price of our redemption. Because then we value better. 
what we do or, or my capacity of praying, everything I do, everything that I do that is beautiful comes from you. If I am able to, I don't know, to forgive, to give myself, to pray. Obviously, St. Paul says that we would not do anything without the help of the Holy Spirit and the help of the heart of Jesus. And that's the joy that comes from the resurrection. That's the joy that experienced Mary Magdalene. It comes from your heart, Jesus. And also, the other thing that I, I, I think is good to, to consider is that we can add to the budget of redemption. You can add right now, wherever you are. And you may think, well, my life is, um, is not relevant. Or the sacrifice of Jesus compared to my sacrifice is nothing. And that's true, objectively. But guess what? Our Lord is not about objective reality. Our Lord is not about that. You, my Lord, you have a different way of doing things. And you're really pleased when we help you in the work of redemption. So for me to understand my love for you as a cooperation for redemption is huge. Because it gives me not the not sense of, a, it's not that I'm worth it because of that, or I'm more worth it because of that. No. But I, my life has meaning. And you take me seriously. And it's beautiful that, to know that, that you, you actually care. I'm not a random person forgotten by God. The morning of the resurrection is about this. It's about both the huge you know, amount of grace awaiting for us in heaven, and also our connection towards that heaven cooperating, recreating the world with Jesus Christ. So it's an adventure. It really is. And to me, my Lord, when I see the world and the impact of your love in history, throughout history, it is so encouraging for, for us to do things. And, and to create is the most divine thing that we can do. So that love allows us to do amazing things. To me, Christianity, your life, the impact of your love, Jesus, throughout history is palpable. Is it is so easy to see it? Sometimes you just need I need to to contemplate things with your eyes. But any act that is a kind act comes from you, and that's beautiful. For instance, I don't know, preparing the table, buying some flowers for someone that you love, calling a friend, preparing a party. The other day, a uh, mom organized a party for her husband and. Uh, invited all his friends. And it was a surprise party. I was invited to 40, 50 people there. And the dad was so shocked with, <laughs> with their children, five or six of them, all of them with a big smile. Nobody knew except the wife. And then all the dudes there, you know, <laughs> celebrating. That's divine. Many things that are divine, that are creations that come from your heart. Our capacity of bringing dignity to this world is what makes the difference. It actually makes a huge difference to dress up well. Uh, women, for instance, you know, using the makeup, dressing in an elegant way, or men shaving and then using a you know jacket, polished shoes, and then caring about the person you have in front of you, washing your car, or also things that are more maybe socially speaking more impactful, like a hospital. The other day I went to a hospital for children. It's a huge divine creation for me, a hospital, to see the doctors, the nurses. Everything is clean. Everything is, 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 really, is welcoming. It's cozy. And people care. And that, to me, is Christian. That is divine. That is not just... It shows you that we're not wolves among wolves. It shows you that there's hope that when human beings do things together, they can accomplish a ton through the grace of God. And maybe they don't know even... They don't know that they are doing it with the grace of God, maybe they do, some of them, but it's there. And at some point in every person's life, there will be an encounter like the one that Mary Magdalene had in a morning like today, when everything seemed to be shut down, when humanity felt lost, when there was no hope. And Jesus Christ, with his voice, a voice that we are able to recognize, because he speaks our language. A voice that is made personal, because Mary felt the accent, the way Jesus would pronounce her name was special for her. And then I recognize you, my Lord, calling me right now, telling me, go to your brothers, go to the whole world, go to your friends, go to your family, and tell them, I'm going to my father and your father, to my God and your God. 
I am inviting you to be part of my family. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, inviting me to be part of his family. That is so beautiful. That's why, my Lord, when I pray, I, I talk to you and you are for real. And that's why I make room for you on a daily basis just to, to keep going to this moment of interaction with you. And, and it sheds light through the whole day. And sometimes problems don't disappear. When I pray, you want me to be part of the adventure, meaning that sometimes you, you just need redemption through darkness, through a cross that is many times nasty, or it could be, humanly speaking, not attractive at all. But you are with me, and you give meaning. And that's what makes it not only bearable, but actually beautiful. And if I cannot do it, if I feel that even knowing that is unbearable for me or it's really, really difficult, I can always pray. To me, there is this wonderful prayer, the memorare, that is so so Christian, so human. It's a prayer that starts saying, remember, please. Remember, Holy Mary, please remember us. And I think it has to do, I don't know the story of the memorare, to be honest, but I think it has to do with the prayer that a good thief Set on the cross, remember you when you get into your kingdom. Remember me. It is so simple and deep at the same time. Those are the best prayers to me. What they are simple and deep, this, I can do it. I, it. It helps me a lot. People saying, Jesus, remember me, please. And then maybe inspired by that, let's go to Mary. Mary, remember me when you when you're in heaven. Remember to say beautiful things to God about me. Remember to to intercede, remember me. And uh, Pope Benedict once was in Lourdes in France, and then he explained a little bit about the memorare. And he said, it's a prayer that expresses this sentiment very well, the sentiment of joy. Mary loves each of her children. She loves you, quite simply because you are her children, her son or daughter. And then talking to Our Lady, Pope Benedict said, because you are the smile of God. That's such a beautiful expression of the definition of Mary. You are, Mary, you are the smile of God, the reflection of the light of Christ, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, because you are the morning star, the gate of heaven, and the first creature to experience the resurrection. We don't know, in, at least in, not in the Bible, we don't know who was the first, but I bet you that before going to Mary Magdalene and Peter and, and the apostles, Jesus somehow appeared to the Blessed Virgin Mary. I mean, I, I'm almost positive about that. It makes sense, right? And just for a second, imagine that encounter. Both of them crying together. With that cry, those tears that makes you release tension and you smile and cry and, and you don't even know what you're doing when you have such an immense joy, but at the same time, you are healing wounds. And Mary embracing our Lord, kissing him, and our Lord so happy, telling her, it's over. I redeemed the world. From now on, every human being will benefit from this cross, from this resurrection, from this passion. Every human being will have access to my heart, and I will heal every single wound every single one of them throughout history, the past, the present, the future, God has gone through everything, every single thing, every single sin that you can imagine. Our Lord has a grace for that, a specific one, an anointment, a, a kind of a, an oil that will heal every single wound. There's no limit for the love of God. So if you and I are happy, it's because there is a reason to be happy. The reason is Jesus Christ is alive. So let's ask Mary Magdalene, let's ask the Blessed Virgin Mary to remember us and to whisper in our ears when we feel lost, when we feel that it's impossible, that our Lord is a, with a big smile telling us, why are, you, why are you crying? And then you, my Lord, pronouncing my name with a specific, like a tailored way that I can understand, that I can follow in the darkness. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Jesus, remember me. Remember us and whisper in our ears anytime we need it 
that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is with us, that he's happy, he's the Rabboni, the teacher, ready to get the, ourselves up, to raise us, to resurrect with him, to take our hands and bring us home, to our home, to the home of the Trinity that from now on is going to be our home forever. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. <laughs> 